All right. So today, I'm going to try to teach you something that you won't believe. I'm going to try to teach you, or explain to you, why we're never going to run out of fossil fuels. Now you have been told over and over again that the world is running out of fossil fuels and someday, maybe someday soon, we'll all be sitting in the coal, in the dark, freezing. And we won't be able to drive our cars and society will collapse. And so today, I'm going to try to convince you this is untrue. Now, I must say there is a, a tendency among humans, for whatever reason, to like these stories of the apocalypse. <laughs> that civilization is going to collapse because we're going to run out of stuff we need for our society. And I'm going to try to introduce you because for most of you, I won't convince you to the concept that we're never running out. Skeptical? Why? You're skeptical. Well, because like we might not run out in our lifetime or like the next 10 lifetimes, but we like eventually I feel like we will. Why do you say this? You feel that we're going to run out eventually, but you're, of course, not sure when. Um, well, because the, there is like a limited supply, and I know that fossil fuels take like millions of years to um, right? develop. So there's a limited supply? I don't there's think so. Supply. Really? I mean, like, there's a certain amount, but there's, there's only so much that's accessible with there's like, only technology. So much that's accessible with modern technology? That's good. That's good. Who else doesn't believe me? There's a finite amount of everything on Earth. Sure. Um, currently, like, with oil, you can drill under the oceans and you can find and find oil. And we're currently getting more technology of like the, the sand oil or whatever it is. Okay. Hydro hydraulic fracking here in this part of the world, but it's yeah. different in different places. So, I mean, we're getting more technology to get more out of the ground than we ever possibly thought we could, but eventually there still is a finite amount. Eventually. You know, I've been hearing this eventually all my life. And we never get there. We never get closer. There's a lot more energy now, energy reserves, fossil fuel reserves in the world than there were 40 years ago. It keeps going up. Why? Why? So, I mean, you know, I go to some stupid party. I try to stay away from parties, but sometimes you can't avoid it, right? And then someone comes up to me and they're trying to make small talk and they say, hey, what do you do for a living? So I go to a party and I say, well, uh, I'm an energy economist. And the person says, oh, when are we running out of energy? And then I say, never. And then they get mad at me. And that kills the party. <laughs> okay? I need, a new prof I need a new fake profession. I don't know. Come on. Espionage contractor? I could be like, I could work, yeah, I could work for NCIS. You know, something like that. Something like a spy. And then when they ask questions, you go, well, I, I'm very sorry, but I can't tell you. That'd be good. That'd be good. You know, I'm like Arnold in True Lies. I tell people my job is to be an energy economist, but in fact, I'm a secret agent. Yeah. That's it. That's the ticket. Anyhow, I can't teach class next week because I'm going, well, I can't tell you. See, that's just a joke. Okay. So, so about every 30 years, there have been predictions 
that we're going to run out of stuff. And so, you know, the U.S. Geological Service has these estimates of reserves, and they say, well, you know, at current levels of production, we only have 20 years left of something. Tungsten is my example. And uh, so, you know, it makes you think, well, gee, in 20 years we'll have no tungsten or anything else. And then we'll all, so society will collapse. And, you know, I think, I remember who this is. I think this is David Malthus, Thomas Malthus from about 1800. This is a person who some people know, Paul Ehrlich. He's a very famous biologist at Stanford. In the late 60s, he wrote a book called The Population Bomb that said we're all going to overpopulate the world. Then he wrote some other things saying we're all going to die. We're all going to be dead by the year 2000. Um, and, you know, Professor Ehrlich keeps saying this. And, you know, according to him, we all should have been dead 15 years ago. But he keeps on saying it. Now, by the way, just I should say that uh, his son-in-law used to be my boss. Um, so uh, his son-in-law was very nice. Um, I knew his daughter, too. She was very nice. But, man, he seems to be a wacko to me. But anyhow, okay, so there's Thomas Malick. Malthus, he's from 1800. You know, he said we're going to use up resources from a couple centuries ago. There's Paul Ehrlich. He's, I guess, Paul is about 75 years old now. He's still with us. Uh, maybe he's 80 years old. Uh, so, you know, this has been going on a long time. And, of course, I don't take it seriously, but, you know, it makes for good exam questions, I suppose. All right. So... Today we've run out of nothing, absolutely nothing. Okay, we've had this industrialized society for 130, 150 years. It's been using up all these materials. Fossil fuel is the most obvious. Steel, tungsten, all these other things. And we have run out of nothing. Even though during this time period, all kinds of prominent people said we were going to run out. Doesn't this make you suspicious? So why has this been incorrect? Well, first of all, you need to think about this term known reserves that our friends at the Geological Service use. And we also have to think about economic incentives. One of the problems people have in economics you know, in economics, you may have noticed what I'm really trying to do is stretch your minds. And now I'm trying to stretch it in a different direction. I'm trying to stretch it across time. So people have trouble thinking about economic incentives over time. So let's think about a world where we had just a little bit of oil left. What would the price of oil be? really, really high, right? Now let's say you were a greedy company, which of course all are. Wouldn't you want to save your oil for when the price is really, really high? Pardon me? Yeah. So then we wouldn't run out of oil because people would be saving their oil. You see, once you start thinking about it in terms of trading off the present versus trading off future incomes, the idea of running out of something actually becomes a contradiction in terms. Almost. Almost. So, geophysicists, it turns out that geologists, by the way, uh, Scott Hodges was, I think he mentioned this, they're like the most optimistic people in the world. It's like, oh yeah, we got a whole bunch of oil here, or natural gas, you know, maybe it's there, maybe it's one. So geologists divide the world into a nice table, and so on one category is the knowledge of the Earth, okay? Now, the problem with knowing about the Earth's crust is what? What's the challenge in knowing about the Earth's crust? It's very varied. 
Right. Well, that's true. But what's the, what's the real inherent problem? It's all the way underground. So it's hard to figure out what's there. And you know this Marcella shale stuff is 8,000 feet below the ground. And, you, pardon? What is it? 8,000 feet. It varies a little bit, but that's about it. Okay. I mean, it's really far down. And you don't know exactly what's there. So you've got, you know, demonstrated reserves, inferred, hypothetical, speculative, all these different kinds of things. I'm not going to ever too sure of the difference in the definitions. But there's all kinds of information, you know, sets out there. We know there's natural gas. We think there's natural gas. There might be natural gas. I got an idea there's natural gas. You know, and all have lower levels of information. Okay. On the other axis, which we'll show up in a minute, is the economic feasibility. Now, two things go into the economic feasibility. What are they? How much it costs to get the gas or oil and how much you can sell it for? Right. How much it costs to get the stuff out of the ground from 8,000 feet and then how much you can sell it for. So here's a nice table. So the minerals that we can actually get out now are parts that are economic and identified. Now this is just today's square, you know. Does anybody live near Oil City? Nobody? Oh, Charlene, do you live? I have a family cabin up there. You have a family cabin? Yeah. Okay. And why is it called Oil City? Oil oh, first oil well. Oil. Right. There used to be lots of oil wells in Oil City. But there aren't now. How come? Well, part of the problem was is that they got into this common pool issue. They drew them close together and stole each other's oil and all that. And so they got a lot of oil up, but they got it out too fast, it turns out. The other problem is that uh, when Tex East, the spindle top play in Texas came in in 1903, Texas oil was like, you know, a third of the cost of Pennsylvania oil. <coughs> So the Pennsylvania oil, you know, went from here to here. So, you know, what have I seen lately? I don't know. If, what kind of new geophysics stuff do they have? Do you, are you familiar with this? Well, what new methods do they have in geophysics? No, no, that's engineering. I'm sorry. Like to figure out what's below the, the Earth. Well, I don't really know, but they have all kinds of new radar and sonar stuff that, um, you know, helps, you know, in the early days, what they used to do is just set off dynamite and record how the waves moved, sound waves moved around. Now they have all kinds of more sophisticated things, but one of the big differences is now they have much better idea of whether there's oil or natural gas there. Another thing that's happened is this hydraulic fracturing which was kind of derived in a um, trial and error method. But here's how it works. By the way, does anybody know what this means, hydraulic fracturing? Maybe get somebody else to explain it. Well, what do you think it means, Lee? Um, they uh, drill down and use water pressure to uh, break apart the earth so they can go. OK. So that's a good part of it. What's another part of it? Right, so, so what happens is a combination. They get a well site and they drill down 8,000 feet. And then the pipe turns horizontal and goes out all the way up to about 10,000 feet. So almost two miles. And then in any well pad, they'll have, it depends, but six or eight of these 
well is going out in all kinds of different directions. Kind of looks like a spider web. Okay? Now, this is relatively new. Oh, the other part. The other thing that's new is basically what they do is they basically explode water into the rock formation at different parts in the horizontal horizontal well. So what they do is they push the water underground, it's got a lot of water, put it under high pressure and then it breaks into the formation and releases the natural gas or oil. Here natural gas, in other places like North Dakota it's oil. And so, wow, all of a sudden this gas that was, you know, over here got to be over here. Of course, there was a countervailing factor. Now that we have all this Marsalis shale gas, what happened to the price of gas? Went down. So, you know, now the price of gas went down. Now, if you talk to uh, producing companies, which I have to do, I, not that I have to do it, I kind of like it, you know, they say they're always looking for the price to go up. I'm not so sure. Why would the price go up? Pardon me, say it again? Well, if, demand, if the price goes up, the quantity <coughs> demand will go down. Well, in general? Scarcity, scarcity increased demand. changes in technology. Well, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but because you never know what the EPA is going to do, but I think that the cost of drilling for this stuff will go down. Um, I don't think the demand will increase, although, you know, I keep waiting for people to drive natural gas cars. So I don't think the price is going back up. Of course, I don't tell them that. Natural gas. There might be a more uh, larger demand. Uh, Why would there, I mean, this is the question, right? Why would there be a larger demand? Because I know Pennsylvania is opening up the first synthetic diesel mm -hmm. refinery, and so they're converting natural gas into a synthetic diesel. Right. To find a new use, right? So maybe. I'm sorry, the person behind you. Uh, <laughs> Right. So now there's a lot of controversy about shipping liquefied natural gas to Europe. So liquefied natural gas being, of course, a gas is very hard to ship overseas. So what you have to do is liquefy it in a liquefaction plant, then put it in a boat and ship it overseas. And not only is that very expensive, but to do that, you have to get permission from the U.S. government, basically. And so there's a whole bunch of people who've applied for permission, and now a couple of plants have been approved. But there's a fear, feeling that if you approve all these plants, then the price of natural gas will go up. Although uh, trying to figure out equilibrium is something I've been trying to do. It's not too clear to me what's going on. But anyhow, I'm not sure at least in the next couple of years that the price of natural gas here in Pennsylvania will go up. But I'm not going to tell that to some of my industry friends. Okay. So, you know, there's room for expansion, right? I mean, our geologist friends can find new ways of finding the oil or natural gas. Our engineering friends can find new ways of getting it out. And then, economically, the price can go up if there's a scarcity. Now, of course, I don't think there's a scarcity here because the price is relatively low. Now there is a scarcity in Japan and Korea because they don't have any natural gas, local natural gas, and it all has to come by ship. Now the Korean, South Koreans are very eager to build a natural gas pipeline from Russia. Anybody know why this hasn't happened? Besides you, Andy? Pardon me? would have to go through North Korea. 
and the North Koreans aren't very friendly. A friend of mine in, in South Korea had this idea. He actually tried to get it done. He was a, where you'd have a pipeline that had no stops on it. It would go south through North Korea into South Korea and then curl back up to North Korea. And so that way the North Koreans couldn't cut it off without hurting themselves. Which as ideas go was kind of clever. But nowadays the North Koreans are so... Uh, 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 I, I can't words like use like crazy and demented because I'm a professor, also a spy. <laughs> but you know, so so let's think about something. I'm gonna model just we had this two period model because that's all the math we can handle, and we're gonna talk about something called rent which is price minus cost. Okay, so you find 100,000 barrels of oil under your backyard, which if you, I mean natural gas, if you live in Lycoming County, or the northern part of the state, is actually not that unreasonable. Okay, but I have to go back. In the United States, you own what's beneath your land, in theory, to the center of the earth. So no one can extract that oil or natural gas without your permission, or some complicated legal things I don't want to talk about. Almost everywhere else, the government owns this land. Which system is better? The one with the government because uh, they're individuals that only probably might not have the resources to actually... I'm, I'm sorry, say it again. Uh, the government is better. Okay. Uh, an individual might not have the money to actually extract whatever it is under its problem. Well, it's true that I don't have the money to extract the oil, but my friends at Exxon are happy to buy that right from me. Right? Let's see. Um, probably the US model works better because it creates wealth in the sense that it puts uh, money back into the economy. Well, I don't know. The government, you know, the government can. Uh, lease out, the, can drill for this land or lease it out and get money and then use it to reduce taxes or pay for the next aircraft carrier or something, right? <coughs> Not sure that's any different. What would be better? Government ownership or private ownership? Well, it's true, but wouldn't you want to have the government in charge, have the ownership then? No. Why not? Because right, you should have the right to lease your own land because if you don't want something doing on that land, you can Oh, interesting. So what you're arguing is that the government might force this upon me. They're, right? They want to try to force you and they want to try to give you a quote unquote good deal, but that's not necessarily, they're not really necessarily looking out Okay, so the argument is that if the government was in charge, hey, they wouldn't care about pollution, they're just interested in the money and the short-sighted effect. Just trying to put some, some frame on this. And so this is the only way, this is a good way to protect ourselves from the government. Is that a good argument? Okay, Did, it, am I making a good argument? I'm trying to phrase your argument. Interesting, interesting. But also, it'd be better to have a private because then it'd be like a free market system in which you can negotiate prices and try. Well, well, wait a second. This is, 
This is like, uh, you know, politician, mostly Republican politicians, just says, the free market is the god we bow to. Why is the free market better here in your argument? Um, because then you can get something out of it as opposed to just the government. Like well, I but wait, isn't the government an agglomeration of the people? I mean, of course, if I happen to have the, the natural gas under my land, then I'm happier. But it's really kind of random who gets this. I want to ask Sarah. Does it create more wealth if there's more competition instead of the government just automatically getting it? Oh, this is bowing to another god. Competition. Why? I want to know why. It creates more wealth. Oh, no. Why does it create more wealth? Does it like, give incentives to like, um, create better technologies to reduce the cost of like, obtaining the oil and therefore like, giving? Like, competition creates like, incentives for like, newer technologies. Now, I think you're getting closer. I think part of it is actually in Iraq, uh, the Iraqi government has hired a bunch of Russian companies to extract the oil. And the reason is, is because the Russians are actually better at doing relatively simple extraction and not using technology, advanced technology. Okay. So part of it is the government isn't too clever about what it does. You don't like that argument? What? No, no, I think it's good. Okay. I, Sarah snorted and it kind of hurt my feelings. Actually, people are coming close. The argument for private ownership is basically, if you think about the Coase theorem, you want to put the property rights in the hands of the people who have the lower transactions cost. Well, transactions cost with the government is really hard, working things through the bureaucracy. So the idea is if you put it in the hand of landowners, hey, they just want money. And so they'll get it out there a lot faster. So you can take or leave it as you want. Okay. Now, you have 100,000 barrels of oil in your backyard. It can be produced either today or next year at a cost of $30 per barrel. The cost today is $100, which means the rent is $70. What time do I have? Uh, oh. The rent is $70. Okay, so rent is price minus cost. Assume that the price next year will be $104 and the interest rate is 5%. Should you extract the oil this year or next year? This year. This year. Why do you say that, Lily? Because um, if it's at 5%, then you'd have um, next year, it wouldn't be, you'd be spending um, more money on interest than you would this year. Hmm. Hmm. I think you might be seeing too much in my question, but. Why do you say next year? Because um, your cost of getting the oil out of the ground will stay the same. You'll be making more money. Okay, so. Also, that interest rate is higher than inflation. Well, we don't have inflation, by the way. Okay, that makes life complicated, and that's part of macroeconomics, which you know I hate. So, how much money will you get this year if you extract it per barrel? You'll get what, 70? And how much oil will you get next year? 74? Assuming your costs stay the same. Assuming your costs stay the same. Okay. <coughs> what would you rather have? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Francis. Well, you don't have any costs, right? It's all profit here. So, so what would you rather have? $70 today or $74 a year from now? Why? Well, that presumably is embedded in the interest rate, but that's a good point. A dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. But what's worth more? $70 today or $74? next year? The same? The same? No. Why do you say that? Right. Well, we don't have inflation. We don't have inflation. No, no, no. Bad, bad, bad. How bad do you need the money? 
How, oh, interesting question. We're going to assume now that you are what we call liquid. So you're not constrained today versus next year, but that's a very real question. Really? So my guess is you view yourself as what we call liquidity constraint. Well, you'd be happy to borrow money from the future to pay your bills today. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So if you got it today for $70, and you invested that money in a year, you get the 20th of that $70. Right. Which is seventy three fifty. Seventy three fifty. So next year you'll have $73.50. As compared to next year, if you extract it, you get $74. So, so if you get $70 today, you could put it in the bank at 5% interest and have $73.50 next year. So it's a choice between having $73.50 next year or $74 next year. Which would you choose? If you invest. If you invest. I'm sorry, somebody said that, but I don't know. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. If you invest, what, what, what if you don't invest? Well, if you don't invest, right, uh, this gets again to this assumption of liquidity constraints, which I'm not doing a good, good job of uh, explaining. But assume you could borrow money at 5% to pay for your expenses today. Or you could put it in the bank at 5%, which is really a stretch, right? So I'm going to argue that the way to think about at least this problem is to think about what you would have next year, okay? Okay. So, you'd rather, you know, so you'd get, with 100,000 barrels, you'd get 7.35 million next year versus 7.4 million if you hold off for a year. Or you could go to an Exxon, which is, in your minds, is a gigantic oil producer. But in my mind, it is an investment bank. They have lots of money, which they use to purchase properties like in your backyard. Okay? And, you know, you'd say, hey, I need money now to pay off my college loans and all kinds of other things because I'm a college student and, you know, I don't have any free cash. I mean, maybe someday I will with this big degree in EBF. So, you'll go sell it to them for some price. Now, Exxon knows they'll get $7.4 million next year so they'll depreciate this by 5%, and they'd be willing to pay 7.048 million, and you'd be willing to take at least $7 million for this. So now there's a negotiation between the two. Okay? But if you believe in this world of limited transaction cost, which I have asserted, though not that strongly, I hope, that is lower when you own the rights than when the government owns the rights, then this property will get, this property will be built not this year, but next year. And so the idea is that when producing a property, you're forever thinking about profits this year versus profits in the future. By the way, who's this guy? Jed Clampett. And how do you know Mr. Clampett? Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's an old television show, The Beverly Hillbillies. Very popular in the late 1960s. I'm sure you can find it today on, I don't know where the heck you find this stuff. Nick at Night 7 or something. 
Now, assume the extractions cost for grading your oil out instead of $30 is $10. So you could get a barrel out today and make $9. Or you get a barrel out you make ninety dollars, excuse me, or you can take a barrel out next year and make ninety four dollars. Now, what would you rather have? Ninety dollars today or ninety four dollars a year from now? Why do you say that? Because you have Well, I got to ask the question again. Would you rather have ninety dollars today or ninety-four dollars a year from now? If I only have one barrel. Well, it's just a question. Ninety-four. Uh, <laughs> Why? I don't know. Just the fact that it's four. Four more. Yeah. What do you think? Is, is it the same interest rate? Same interest rate, five percent. So ninety. Why do you say 90 today? Because if you do the interest off of $90, you'll get $94.50. You'll get $94.50. So if you put the $90 in the bank and wait a year, you'll have $94.50. Okay? So in general, the lower cost sources of oil are extracted first because the rent rises faster in time on the high cost oil than on the low cost oil. Now why do I refer to Jed Clampett oil as low cost oil? So as the song goes, you know the song? Well, well, you could sing it. I can't. Listen, here's a story. About a, we can do it after class. <laughs> so as the song goes, Mr. Clampett was out there with a the rifle and shooting at a squirrel for food. And he missed the squirrel, and the bullet went into the, le into the ground, and oil spurted out. And then Mr. Clampett and his mother-in-law and his daughter and his nephew, the family connections in the campus were kind of unclear. They took their money and moved to a mansion with a cement pond in Beverly Hills, California. Okay? <coughs> so the idea here is that you want to drill for the low cost oil first. So there's no more oil left like they had in Texas in 1903 this huge gusher from Spindletop. But that doesn't mean we're running out of oil. And of course, if you really have nothing to do, you can go rent the Beverly Hillbillies. Um, although, I don't know. I mean, you know, we could, and then you could, you could argue whether what was a better show, Beverly Hillbillies or Green Acres. And yeah, I would have success you not spent a lot of time doing that. Okay. So here's a problem I like to ask on an exam. So write it down, everybody. You own a well with 100 barrels of oil in it. Today the price is $100. Next year it'll be $102. Your cost of extracting the oil is X. For what levels of X will you extract the oil today versus next year. How would I do this problem, by the way? Well, 
I would put my profits as a function of x today, which would be 100 minus x, and then I'd put it in future terms, so I'd multiply that by 1.03, and I'd ask that to be less, to be greater than, excuse me, the profits next year, which is 102 minus x, and then I'd solve for x. So let's see what we have here. Okay. So, if you produce today, you make 100 minus x per barrel. Then you put in the bank at 3%, you have 103 minus 1.03x next year. Does this make sense? I'm hoping it makes sense. Okay. If you produce tomorrow, you get 102 minus x. Okay. So the question is, is producing today with a profit of 103 minus 1.83x pay off more than producing next year, which is 102 minus x? And when you solve that out, you get that x is less than 33 and a third. I hope. That's 1, that's 0.03, yeah. So, for low production cost, you produce today. For high production cost, you wait till next year. All right, does that make sense? Let's see what the next slide says. So, you know, people have a lot of time thinking about this, um, thinking about over time. But if you look at more agricultural products, you know, uh, so wheat is harvested in the fall, but we don't run out of wheat in the market over the summertime, that basically people hold wheat off the market because I would expect the price of wheat is in general higher in the summer than in the winter. Perhaps a clearer example is forest. So there are private foresters all across this state. They grow trees. You plant a tree. You don't cut it down depending on the species for 20 to 50 years. And so some of you, if you like, if you're EBF majors, you can go take forestry economics which some people like, and uh, talk about this, which basically comes down to how long do you keep the trees off the market? Now, if you didn't do this, then no one would grow trees. And we wouldn't have paper or other stuff. Okay? And so for depletable resources, sometimes the product can be held off the market for a long time. Okay? people then bring up ethical concerns. I mean, if we use the energy now, aren't we harming our ancestors? Shouldn't we care about future generations? Shouldn't we have a more, ooh, that word. What word am I talking about? Sustainable. sustainable. Shouldn't we have a more sustainable economy? Sustainable is like the worst word in the galaxy. We have to put it in all our reports, like, you know, how we're going to make a sustainable department. Hey, we're the department getting in charge of getting stuff out of the ground. What do you want out of us? But we're sustainable, too. Should we reduce our energy consumption now so that people 50 years from now won't have high energy prices? What do you think? Mm, interesting, but just, just because I'm running out of time, 
I will ask, I will say no. Shouldn't we care about future generations? Shouldn't we get rid of our addiction to energy, to fossil fuels? Oh, no one wants to bite on this, huh? All right. What would you think if people, if you read that people in 1910 had the same argument? Well, we shouldn't consume oil now because we have to worry about people in 2014. How would that strike you in reading back upon it? <laughs> Pardon me? Well, do you think they should have consumed less so we should be richer today? Do you think they should have consumed less so we could be richer today? Why not? Well, why is it dumb? Well, they're greedy too. Who? We got so wealthy because of their consumption. Well, we're a lot wealthier than people in 1910. So the idea that we should we should wait now, you know, I expect people in the future to be wealthier than we are. Now I have one more point to make, so I'm going to take you a couple minutes late. I know you're growing anxious. Is the price of oil or natural gas going to go up or down in the future? Up? Why do you say up? Sure, it goes up and down over time. Price of natural gas has plummeted. Yeah, so it'll be a higher cost to get it. Why do you say that? Because we deplete the easy ones first. But what else happens? New technology. New technology. Okay. Theory doesn't tell us, by the way, that the price will go up in time. Theory tells us that the rent the price minus the cost will go up over time. But the cost keeps, of getting stuff keeps declining. Thanks to people. Oh no, I got one more point to make. Oh, I'm done. Next time, we'll talk about the economics of owning your own oil property. <laughs> <laughs>